crewmen who survived the harrowing dangers of nine grueling Pacific War Patrols on USS Bofin tell a story of one of the most remarkable submarines ever to carry the American flag into harm's way. They overcome every undersea peril to destroy and defeat an enemy relentlessly dedicated to Bofin's destruction. I've seen this deck awash with sweat and condensation and pure fear. I'm not lying to fear, and fear sweat stinks. Her sailors nickname Bofin the Pearl Harbor Avenger, and they make the name stick with their dogged determination and courage. They were under horrific conditions. They were roughly between 78 and 88 men on a small tube, 289 feet in length, 16 feet in diameter, uh, being uh, in the enemy waters. The Bofin's puny 1,525 tons leaves her 30 times smaller than the hulking new American battleships. Yet she claims somewhere between 68,000 and 145,000 tons of enemy shipping destroyed in less than two and a half years of battle more than the monstrous Missouri sinks in nearly half a fighting century. A fisherman's guide cautions, when you confront a bowfin, you are in for a hearty battle. Bowfin feed on all kinds of foes. The bowfin has a great surge of power in a fight, so treat it with respect as it takes off on a rampage. The Japanese Imperial Navy would feel the bite of the gray steel version. For the best part of a year after Pearl Harbor, the Japanese Imperial Navy rules the Pacific. Japan's war strategy appears fully achieved. With sea lanes to Japan secured, the Emperor's armies race through Malaya and the East Indies to seize the oil, rubber, and rice needed to sustain a resource-poor homeland. There seems no allied weapon on the horizon to challenge Japanese expansion. But the Japanese have made a small, fatal mistake. There were four submarines at Pearl Harbor, and they were not attacked. The fuel depots behind them were not attacked, so we were able to commence offensive operations essentially the next day but reinforcements are needed. Bofin is one of a flood of new submarines being rushed to completion to provide an offensive weapon for the Navy while the shattered fleet is rebuilding. The class previous to Bofin was the Gato class, and their hulls were built to withstand pressures down to approximately 500 feet. Uh, Bofin was what they call a thick skin boat, a Baleo class and her seven eighths of an inch of high tensile steel pressure hull was meant to stand pressures down to at least 600 feet. Bofin builds in less than five months. She launches on December 7th, 1942 at Portsmouth Navy Yard in New Hampshire, one year to the day after the Pearl Harbor attack. USS Bofin is 311 feet long and 27 feet across her widest beam. She displaces 1,525 tons, but that doesn't begin to describe the space constrictions. Outer hull spaces are massively consumed by the ballast, fuel, air, and water tanks that enable the boat to dive, surface, and maneuver. The pressure hull inside that built to withstand the huge squeeze of the depths is a steel cylinder only 16 feet in diameter and 274 feet long, much of that reduced internally by machinery, torpedoes, and stores. Bofin's frail-looking periscopes, her eyes for attack, 
are actually massive rotating and extending cylinders anchored in her keel and when fully deployed reach upward the height of a six-story building. Bofin divides into eight compartments and a conning tower. The forward torpedo room holds six torpedo tubes with ten reloads. An aft torpedo room holds four stern tubes and four reload torpedoes. The forward and aft battery compartments contain two 126-cell Exide batteries, each cell weighing 1,650 pounds for submerged running. The control room houses helm, diving controls, radar displays, and air manifold controls. Above is a small conning tower with twin periscopes where the captain commands during submerged attacks. Two engine rooms house four General Motors 16-cylinder diesel engines used when running on the surface. They develop 1,600 horsepower each, with those driving four General Electric main generators to charge batteries. The electric motors for submerged running develop 1,375 horsepower, driving two eight-foot propellers. To feed her diesels, Bofin's bunkers carry 54,000 gallons of fuel oil that can keep her patrolling for three months. Inside the slim tube of Bofin's pressure hull squeezes a crew of 70 that ordinarily includes a captain, seven officers, eight chief petty officers, and 54 crew whose average age is barely 20, and they are ready to fight. August 25, 1943, after eight months of training and sea trials after launching, Commander Joseph H. Willingham is taking USS Bofin on its first war patrol out of Fremantle, Australia, home of the Southwest Pacific Submarine Command. The idea of patrolling for prey is new and untried and a U.S. Navy trained in obsolescent battle tactics. Our old skippers, the skippers around the submarines at the time, they really weren't prepared for an aggressive approach, and it took younger skippers that really take the battle to the enemy. Commander Willingham, already an undersea veteran with two kills of Japanese submarines to his credit, is one of the best of the new breed. The crew takes on the personality of its command officer. So if you have an aggressive skipper who's very successful, the crew carries a certain swagger as it goes around the waterfront, and everybody knows they're on, quote, a hot boat. Bofin's first hunt for prey begins off the southern Philippines after she has first delivered guns and supplies to guerrillas. Her lookouts become the most important men on the surfaced Bofin. They mount stations on the periscope shears, even a few more feet of elevation, adding miles of visual range to the horizon. On mid-morning of September 25th, lookouts sight the smoke of a convoy. Bofin and her sister ship, Billfish, race on the surface to put themselves ahead of it. It will be one of the first U.S. submarine wolf pack attacks. Bofin begins a long, hazardous career, avenging the dead sailors of Pearl Harbor. On September 25, 1943, all of Bofin's brilliant design and long training comes into play as she stalks a Japanese convoy and its escort patrol boat. She prepares to submerge and begin the complexities of stalking an enemy from below. At two blasts of Bofin's diving alarm and the oral command, dive, dive, the bridge is cleared and the access hatch closed. Captain Willingham trains his crew to achieve full submergence in 45 seconds from his first dive order. Bofin is built around swift control of buoyancy through a brilliantly balanced system of ballast tanks. They're flooded to submerge or blown dry by compressed air to surface. 
At 1.10, Bofin releases four torpedoes at a big Hasumaru-class merchantman. The weapons speed away in a widening spread to allow for minor discrepancies in targeting. As his torpedoes run to his targets, Willingham swings Bofin about to bring his stern tubes to bear. Another four torpedo spread flies outward toward an oil tanker in the enemy column. Tension mounts in Bofin as a stopwatch counts down the estimated running time of the torpedoes. An elated Willingham counts three hits, two strike the big merchantman, and a third explodes on the oil tanker. An instant later, the Japanese spot Bofin's periscope, and the convoy's escort ship comes racing for its revenge. There begins what is to become a war-long ritual for the sub, evading what would become increasingly savage and sophisticated enemy counterattacks. Bofin will escape, but at a cost to her record. The speed at which Willingham has to take Bofin down, as well as inadequate Japanese records, produce a situation that is to frustrate American submariners for the entire war. Sometimes our skippers were driven down after they had made an attack before they could get the picture of the ship being sunk. You heard the breakup noises, you heard the deep rumbling of the death throes of that ship, but you couldn't actually verify it. Thousands of tons of enemy shipping claimed as sunk by the Bofin are disallowed after the war, without doubt understating her great record. Still, Bofin is now blooded and sharpened for anything the enemy can throw at her on her next patrol. Captain Willingham's splendid efforts bring him promotion to a submarine division, and a strong new skipper comes to Bofin. Redheaded, slender, and fearless, Commander Walter Thomas Griffith now commands the Bofin, and he will make impressive use of her. Both Willingham, the first command officer, and Griffiths were very aggressive skippers. Bofin's assigned hunting area is the Indochina coast, where she is to attack ships bringing Malayan oil and rubber to Japan's war industries. So many of our attacks were at night on the surface. Captain Griffith, he uh, believed in night attacks. And you could maneuver the ship a lot faster, get in and get out, uh, 20 knots compared to four or five knots submerged. Griffith gets a chance for his surface attack in shallow and constricted waters on the hectic night of November 25, 1943. Bofin, moving on the surface, finds herself in the middle of a five-ship Japanese convoy. Despite a malfunctioning diesel, Captain Griffith races to the attack. As Griffith prepares to fire, he knows he's fighting a second enemy in the suspect reliability of his main weapon. The 21-foot American Mark 14 torpedo is inferior in every way to its enemy counterparts. It's deficient in range, speed, guidance, and warhead strength. It runs at only two speeds, a 45-knot setting, giving it a scant 4,500-yard range or a 31.5 knot setting, propelling it for 9,000 yards. Airstream propulsion leaves telltale bubbles, and the 600-pound explosive charge is far from devastating. You could fire a torpedo, hit your target head on, and it would not explode. Or it ran too deep, or it ran too shallow, or it would broach on the way to the target, alerting them. The Bureau of Ordnance has designed a magnetic exploder meant to detect a steel hull and set off the warhead under an enemy's keel to break the ship's back. It fails as often as it works, with torpedoes passing harmlessly beneath the enemy. And of course, we had people who were in command 
in charge of submarine operations that felt that had been in the Bureau of Ordnance and thought that the thing ran perfectly. And of course, they resisted the reports of the skippers. They thought it was a question of the skippers not being aggressive enough. The bowfin is not only good, but lucky during this night. Firing from both bow and stern tubes with the magnetic detonators deactivated and the torpedoes set to go off on contact, he hits two oil tankers and leaves them in flames with one cut in half. And I'm able to observe the torpedo wake in, in the water as they head, headed towards the tanker and suddenly witness this huge explosion, nothing but a huge flash of light, and then nothing in the water. Captain Griffith was commanding officer. We were fighting at night, and we'd hit several ships, and they were burning and what have you. And all of a sudden, he all back emergency. We almost ran into half of the hull of one of the ships we'd sunk. A lot of people seem to think that after every sinking, we'd uh, have a drink and celebrate and what have you. We only didn't. By the time the attack was over with, you were tired out and just wanted to go lay down for a while. And it's because some of these attacks and tracking parties would go on for 36 hours at a stretch. By four the next afternoon, Bofin catches and sinks a coastal freighter. And then, at two in the morning, gets word that her sister sub, the Billfish, has located another convoy, five ships with an escort. Attacking on the surface, Captain Griffith catches up and at 3.14 fires six torpedoes. Four explode on his first target and two on his second. A Japanese skipper speeds his armed merchant vessel straight at the submarine, his five-inch gun scoring a hit on both in. We started in for another attack, and as we fired, we got hit in the superstructure. The shell actually bounced off the pressure hull, which was curved, and went through the superstructure and hit our main air induction lines and our low pressure blow lines, and it just blew them apart. Uh, theoretically, we couldn't dive anymore because this would flood the boat with all this water up there. Someone made a remark to the captain, do you want to break off? And he said, no, I'm going to sink the son of a bitch. And that's just what he did. Griffith swings his stern tubes toward the firing attacker. Both torpedoes strike the enemy vessel and break her back. Now the Bofin must make the 1,200-mile journey, limping back to port. Bofin takes on more than new stores and torpedoes at Fremantle. To the annoyance of all submariners, the end of every patrol means the transfer of many close friends to other boats. We would take and rotate roughly 25 to 30 percent of the crew off. We had a tremendous building program, building submarines. And so as we began to build those new ships and new submarines, we populated them with skippers that were already had experience and we populated them with crews that had experience so that everybody wasn't new. As Bofin sets out on her third and fourth war patrols, she will find herself being overtaken at last by bad luck and bad torpedoes. After having endured eight erratic torpedo runs on Bofin's third war patrol, Captain Griffith's patience nears the breaking point on her fourth. Although Bofin is in some of the richest hunting grounds, the Straits of Macassar in the East Indies, he is not getting the kills his boat deserves. Barely half the torpedoes he fires are detonating properly against enemy hulls. All he can do is make Bofin's hunting and firing techniques as flawless as possible, and his crew never falters in the demanding firing routine. When we made contact with the enemy, uh, we were all very excited. The entire crew was excited. And of course, the uh, main operation was in the uh, conning tower, which is right above here. The ca captain would be on the periscope lo looking uh, 
looking at the target. He would be trying to determine the position of the, what they call angle on the bow, the direction that the enemy target ship was, was headed. Captain Griffith is in the cramped conning tower now, hunched down to the four foot nine inch height that is the maximum above deck extension of the periscope eyepiece. The periscope itself is not only a masterpiece of precision optics, but a measuring implement for setting up the torpedo run. The Bofin's Cole Morgan attack periscope clicks to magnification settings from 1.5 to 6 power. The upper prism can be tilted to allow for air search, but a key strength of the periscope is how it transmits targeting information to the Torpedo Data Computer, or TDC. Far less sophisticated than the microchip-driven wonders of today, Bofin's TDC is an analog computer with range and data input to perform complex calculations with high speed and accuracy. We, we put certain information like the distance, and uh, we, we would determine the, the speed the ship was going, whether it was zigzagging or not, and if it was zigzagging, what kind of zigzag uh, course. And we pretty much determine uh, the direction and speed of that target. The TDC constantly updates the sub's course and speed from the master gyro compass and speed log. Continually, Griffith is checking his estimates through other subtleties, such as the size of the target's bow wave and the sonarman's count of propeller revolutions. The TDC's calculations are automatically programmed into the torpedoes to set directional gyros. Depending upon the size of the target, we, we would uh, set the depth of the torpedo. Small ship, maybe six feet, a big ship, maybe 12 feet. But even when the torpedoes work and an enemy ship goes down, life on the Bofin is seldom easy. The grind of undersea service takes its toll. Such claustrophobic discomfort inflicted over long weeks is why all of Bofin's crews are volunteers and carefully screened for patient, even temperament. Each man has to keep functioning under hideous tensions and conditions. It was stifling. You got used to it. You can get used to anything, but you don't like it. But the deck in the after battery where the sleeping compartment is, when they had full charge going, that deck would get so hot, you could not walk on it barefooted. The head to a sailor is a toilet to everybody else. But they vented inside, so that was nice. as a perfume, you know. And on top of that, we had the diesel fumes, the lube oil fumes, and pure, pure sweat. We didn't have enough bunks for the entire crew. So the man on watch would go wake up his relief. The relief would get up and come to the station, and he'd get in that bunk. So he was sleeping in somebody else's sweat, but we all smelled it like anyway. Our, our fresh water was always a problem. Our Klein Smith stills, which we had two of them, made 750 gallon every uh, 24 hours. But the batteries had priority. If you want it off, you can pack your bag, tell the kid, the executive boss you want it off, and you would get off. I mean, it was that simple. There was no, no argument or nothing. They didn't even ask you why. Incredibly, few ask off and treasure their few comforts. We had the best food in the Navy because it, if they wouldn't issue it to us, we'd steal it, we'd get a working party and take it. Normally we had probably the best cooks too. But mostly, it's the camaraderie of the shared hardship and peril that keeps both ends crew going. Meanwhile, month by month, the Japanese become increasingly sophisticated in both submarine hunting techniques and equipment. They begin laying mines across choke points used by U.S. submarines for transit. The Japanese typically sow anti-submarine minefields to cover not just a wide surface area, but a variety of depths anchoring the weapons in overlapping patterns for maximum coverage. Detonation mechanics vary, and mines might be set off by contact, magnetic fields, hull turbulence, or acoustic sensors. In another threat to Bofin, Japanese patrol planes now have radar. 
In greater numbers than ever, they patrol at wave top heights to come rapidly to point blank range. The planes force Bofin under the surface up to a dozen times a day, often calling in hunter killer surface forces. Ominously, the enemy has by now learned that Bofin's class of sub can dive far below the 300 feet once thought its maximum. The Japanese uh, basically began to understand that we were going at a deeper depth, so they began to build a larger depth charges up to 1,000 pounds. Rather than just roll the charges over the stern to cover a constricted area, the enemy patrol boats now coordinate attacks and employ throwing guns to propel the charges in vastly wider patterns. The depth charges are set to explode at the anticipated depth of the submarine, with the hope that the boat can be caught in the middle of two explosions, with water pressure crushing the hull between the blasts in a hammer and anvil effect. Bowfin sailors come to know the dismal terrors of being trapped helplessly beneath a cold ocean as terrifying blasts shatter bulbs, spring leaks, and threaten to drown them all in a steel coffin. Sometimes, a descending charge thumps against the hull, hopefully headed for a greater depth. A frustrated Bowfin returns home. She has to date fired 113 torpedoes and gotten a gratifying number of hits but only 56 of the weapons have exploded as they were meant to. It is Captain Griffith's final patrol on Bofin. When Bofin slips out of Fremantle on April 25, 1944, on her fifth war patrol, she has a new skipper replacing the reassigned Commander Griffith. She heads up toward the Palau Islands off the Philippines, where it is suspected that a significant naval battle might be shaping up as MacArthur moves amphibious invasion forces into the area. Commander Griffith has been replaced on Bofin by Commander John Corbus. The crew soon misses the aggressive Griffith. There are no secrets on a submarine. So when the new skipper comes on board, everybody sort of holds their breath, sort of evaluating what he can do compared to the previous skipper. And it is a very quick study. You can sense it in the way that the skipper makes the periscope approach and sees the target and says, I wonder what's over there. or oh, I don't want to go over there. If he's not providing them the results, uh, the crew quickly will pass that word around that we don't think this guy can really do it. Corbis on his fifth run was very conservative about everything. He was awful cautious trying to get in on ships and so forth. And it was quite a contrast from what we'd had for the other runs. When I heard a boat taking a beating, and the depth charge that was going off sounded to me as if two destroyers were working crisscrossing him. And I thought, sure, that Captain Corbett would go back and assist that submarine and try to help him out. But instead, he turned around and went the other way. Somebody talked to him at uh, Pearl, and I don't know who it was, but somebody really talked to him because at sixth run, he went crazy out there. He had a hell of a good record. Under a dramatically more aggressive corpus, Bofin's 6th War Patrol adds impressive victories to her battle flag. Getting underway on her 6th War Patrol on July 16, 1944, Commander Corbus returns Bofin to hunting with her customary belligerence. Bofin is now sailing out of Hawaii and patrolling the waters off southern Japan. Her primary mechanical search weapon is SJ radar. The SJ is a rotating directional radar, giving both bearing two a contact and distance.
because its search is line of sight, it is mounted on an extendable mast behind the periscopes to add range to its scan. To see before being seen is priceless. Finally picked up a small convoy of three ships, and they were small ships. They, they were heading into some little port someplace, so captain elected to follow them at a reasonable distance so we wouldn't be spotted. So we got up a little closer and submerged and then hauled them into this little harbor. And once they got in there, two of the ships tied up alongside of a pier, and which had a bus and a crane on it. And the other one anchored out a ways. And as we got in and uh, got in a good firing position, he let go six torpedoes forward. And two of them were fired at the ship that anchored and they missed, they ran up on the beach. Fortunately, the other four managed to sink the two ships that tie up alongside the pier and it blew the bus and the crane off the pier too and just destroyed the pier. The Bofin becomes the only submarine whose battle flag of sinkings includes an enemy crane and bus. Corbus is even bolder and more skillful in an attack on three big transports, convoyed by two destroyers and covered by patrolling aircraft. As he finishes firing his torpedoes, Corbus sees spectacular hits on all three transports and one of the destroyers, watching one of the transports go down. That the Japanese do not report losses of shipping under 500 tons reduces kill claims. But even tiny vessels are vital targets. The enemy has equipped great numbers of fishing and sailing craft, often armed, with powerful radios as an early warning system against US planes and ships. For their sinking, Bofin wastes no torpedoes. The Bofin mounts a potent deck gun aft of her bridge, a weapon highly effective against surface targets. In various configurations throughout the war, Bofin mixes lighter, secondary batteries of a fast-firing Bofors 40mm and Orlikan 20mm guns mounted fore and aft of the conning tower. These are devastating to enemy crews in close-up work and a potent anti-aircraft weapon. With many Japanese small craft armed with at least light weapons, Bofin becomes accomplished at winning hot gunfire exchanges and acquires the battle scars to show for it. After the brutal wear and tear inflicted by enemy depth charges, machine gun bullets, and shell fragments over six war patrols, the Bofin arrives in Pearl Harbor for much needed repairs and refitting. She upgrades to a harder hitting five inch deck gun and replaces an aft 20 millimeter gun station with a more potent 40 millimeter weapon. She takes on new mine detecting sonar to counter the increasing Japanese use of mine defenses. On January 25th, 1944, Bofin's 7th War Patrol heads her for Japanese East Coast waters. As the enemy empire has steadily contracted under a successful string of amphibious invasion campaigns across the Pacific, the once wide-ranging submarines are called close to the home islands. A crucial assignment is lifeguard duty. Bofin sets itself up on the routes over which damaged B-29 bombers and carrier planes struggling home from strikes on Japan have been going into the water. With her fellow submariners, she contributes to the rescue of 305 ditching aviators. The Tang, I think, picked up 26 at one time. There was prisoners that Japanese were transferring from Singapore to Japan. We picked up some Australians. And the Australians got aboard and, and once he got in this crowded condition and, and seen how we did, he asked the captain to let him back off again. He'd rather be out in the water than be crapped be in one of these sewer pipes.
It is during Bofin's 8th War Patrol from April 23rd to May 15th, 1945. Commander Alexander Tyree assumes command from Captain Corbus. He inherits a crew enduring not only the terrible tensions of war, but the human and physical pressures of life in a suffocating, tightly stratified military society. Respect is earned and sometimes denied. What bothered me as an officer, a young officer, was that we had black uh, uh, men to serve us our food. We're in, a, in the wardrobe area, the officer's area, and the only blacks on the submarine are stewards to take care of the fancy officers. Life here was miserable. It was no piece of cake. But you, got, you can get used to anything if you have to. You just didn't sleep a complete night. There's no such thing as, in fact, my sleeping patterns are still bad. And I, I blame it, I blame it on that. But more dangerous discomforts are fast approaching. Bofin has a last great test coming as a radio message interrupts her eighth patrol and calls her to her most dangerous mission yet. With the Pacific swept clean of targets for its submarines, the Navy sees one more risky opportunity to raid the last of the enemy's sustaining sea lanes. Bofin will become part of a nine-sub wolf pack to penetrate Japan's last and most carefully guarded sea stronghold, the Sea of Japan. The goal is to interrupt the lifeline of war commodities and food flowing to Japan by ship from the mainland industries of China and Korea. It was a dream of every submariner to make a war patrol in the Sea of Japan because Tokyo Rose said we couldn't get our submarines into the Sea of Japan. So there were only two entrances to the Sea of Japan. One of them was heavily mined. The other was a very narrow strait, which was uh, uh, near a uh, military base that uh, uh, had patrol vessels and planes. Uh, uh, and they also had mines. Uh, so uh, it was a dangerous uh, patrol. On the way through into the straits, it took us 17 hours submerged. We went through minefields with the, with the mines set at three meters, 10 meters, and 13 meters. One time we did uh, get so close that the cable of the uh, mine scraped the hull of the boat from the bow to the stern. Bofin's main mine avoidance tool is the new FM sonar that can detect a mine up to a third of a mile away by detecting bounce back of sound waves projected through water. At evidence of a mine, it sounds a bell-like warning tone that gives ample time for evasion and becomes known as Hell's Bells. The guy man on the helm was already turning his wheel to head away from that mine just a little bit and they managed to go through them that way. In addition to the mines, depth charges are an ever-present threat. Well, on the eighth run was the worst depth charge I have ever in. There was an escort vessel and a tanker, and the old man, instead of shooting the escort, he shoots the damn tanker. So the escort has nothing to protect, and all it did was work us over. It unloaded depth charges on us and knocked us down to 620 foot in the after torpedo room with an up angle on the boat. We couldn't pump, we couldn't blow. On this type of boat, I think it was redlined about 450 feet. We got about 60 depth charges and all in just a few minutes. And it's like getting your head in a number two wash tub and somebody beating on it with a baseball bat. And I can remember leaning on this chart table like this, and I didn't know whether my legs would hold me. But I looked around, and <laughs> there was a bunch of white elbows on this, on this table. 
Well, that made you feel better. You know, misery likes company. Like all hunted subs, Bofin seeks to find a thermocline where there is a layer of changed water temperature to dive beneath. They were pinging, hunting for us, but they were obviously having trouble finding us because the thermal was bending their sound waves that were to echo back to, the, to, the, to them, and uh, they couldn't find us. Although the Sea of Japan proves disappointingly empty of rich targets, the U.S. Wolf Pack sinks 30 enemy vessels, with both in accounting for two. But the American marauders pay a high price for their audacity. The Japanese have had a victory, too. There is a special agony on Bofin as the subs gather to break back to the Pacific through the Japanese cordon. There has been no word from Bonefish or all their friends aboard her for many hours. Slowly, hopes that it is just a radio problem fade away. The wolf pack will later learn that a Japanese hunter-killer group has found Bonefish and destroyed her with all hands. You get closer than brothers, and when one of them dies, it's just like losing one of the family. Now, that, that may sound strange this day and time, but it's true. After five days in the Sea of Japan, Wolfpack Commander E.T. Heidman decides that speed is the best defense and elects to run out of the Sea of Japan surfaced. What we're going to do is go ahead, all ahead flank, which would give us 20 to 21 knots. There's no way that someone could not know when we were leaving. All eight boats had all their mufflers burned out. And it was just one loud roar as you went through. The bold move pays off, and Bofin runs through safely with the pack. With the end of fighting in the Pacific in August of 1945, Bofin is called back from her 10th and last war patrol. She never gets into battle again, but her crew never forgets all they accomplished with her. Our grandchildren would, would be speaking Japanese if we had not been in World War II submarine service, where more than half of all of the Japanese vessels sunk were sunk by submariners, even though uh, maybe 20, 25% of all the submariners themselves perished. She had nine war patrols, and she claimed 44 ships sunk. Bofin was one of only five vessels during World War II to receive both the Presidential Unit Citation and the Navy Unit Commendation, the two highest awards any vessel can receive. She's in and out of commission for years, finding no combat in the Korean War. In 1960, she's refurbished and serves as a Naval Reserve training vessel. Her final decommissioning comes in 1971, but the crews who love her are not about to let her be scrapped or used as a missile target. After years of tireless efforts by ex-submariners, the Bowfin is lovingly rebuilt and set up in 1981 as a museum ship. She floats in good company next to the Arizona Memorial Complex at Pearl Harbor. The pains, terrors, and sacrifices that took place in her must be left to the imagination of the visitors, but they are as real as the hundreds of Bofin heroes who endured them. USS Bofin stands as a memorial, not just to her own glories, but to the memory of the 374 officers and 3,131 U.S. World War II submariners on eternal patrol. <laughs>